Last Re by Honoré Dufay. First Part. Book 2. While these things were happening in this way between these shepherds and shepherdesses, Celadon received from the three beautiful nymphs, in the palace of Isor, all the best possible reliefs that were possible to them, but the work which the water had given him had been so great that whatever remedy they did to him, he could not open his eyes, nor give any sign of life other than by the beating of the heart, thus passing the rest of the day and a good part of the night before he returned to himself, and when he opened his eyes, it was not with little astonishment to find himself where he was, for he remembered very well what had happened to him on the edge of Lignon, and as despair had made him jump into the water, but he did not know how he had come to this place, and after remaining confused for some time at this thought, he wondered whether he was alive or dead. If I live, he said, how is it possible that the cruelty of a stray does not cause me to die? And if I am dead, what, O oh love, do you come to seek between this darkness? Do you not content yourself with having had my life, or do you want to rekindle your old flames in my ashes? And because the bitter care which a stray had left him, not having abandoned him, always called to him all his thoughts, he continued, And you, too cruel memory of my past happiness, why do you represent to me the displeasure she once had of my loss in order to enclose my true evil by her imagined, instead of, to lighten me, you should rather tell me how satisfied she is with the hatred she has for me. With a thousand similar imaginations, this poor shepherd went back to sleep from such a long sleep that the nymphs were free to come and see how he was, and, finding him asleep, they gently opened the windows and curtains, and sat down around him to contemplate him better. Galathi, after having considered him for a while, was the first who said in a low voice so as not to awaken him, that this shepherd is changed from what he was yesterday, and how the bright color of his face has returned to him in a short time. As for me, I do not pity the trouble of the journey, since we saved his life, for, as you say, my cuteness, she said, addressing Sylvie, he is one of the principles of this country. Madam, replied the nymph, he is very certain, for his father is Alcipi and his mother Amaryllis. How, she said, is that Alcipi of whom I have heard so much speak, and who, in order to save his friend, forced the prisons of the Visigoths at Assen? That's the very one, said Sylvie. I saw him five or six months ago, at a feast that was unemployed in these hamlets which are along the banks of Lignon, and because on all the other Alcipi seemed to me worthy of being looked at, I held my eyes on him for a long time, for the authority of his chenu beard and his venerable old age makes him honoured and respected by everyone. But as for Celadon, he remembers that of all the young shepherds, only he and Sylvander dared to approach me. By Sylvander I knew who Celadon was, and by Celadon who was Sylvander, for both had in their manners and speeches something more generous than the name of Berger carries. However, as Sylvie spoke, a more, to mock the subtleties of Climanthus and Polmar which were the cause that Galathius had found herself the day before at the place where she had taken Celadon, began to make the nymph feel the effects of a new love, for, as long as Sylvia spoke, Galathi always had her eyes on the shepherd, and the praises she gave him were cause that at the same time her beauty and virtue, one by sight, and the other by hearing, made the same blow in her soul, and this all the more easily as she found herself prepared for it by the deception of Climanthus, who, feigning the soothsayer, had foretold her that the one she would meet where she found Celadon must be her husband if she did not want to be the most unhappy person in the world, having previously made a design that Polma, as if by mistake, would go there at the hour he had told her, so that, disappointed by this ruse, she would take will to marry him, which otherwise could not afford her the affection she had, for Lindama. But fortune and love, which mock prudence, made Celadon find there by chance which I have told you, so that Galathi, wishing in every way to love this shepherd, went purposely to represent all things in him much more lovable, and seeing that he did not awaken, to let him rest at his ease, she went out as gently as she could and went away to entertain her new thoughts. There was near his room a hidden staircase which descended into a low gallery, by which, with a drawbridge, one entered the garden arranged with all the rarities that the place could allow, be in fountains and flowerbeds, was in alleys or shades, having been forgotten nothing of all that artifice could add to it. On leaving this place, one entered a large wood of various kinds of trees, one square of which was of Kudriars who, altogether, made such a graceful Daedalus that yet the paths by their various detours are confused in each other, if they did not leave, for their shades, to be very pleasant quite close to there, in another square, 
was the fountain of the truth of love, source of the marvelous truth, for, by the force of enchantments, the lover who looked at himself there saw the one he loved, that if he was loved by her, he saw himself there, that if by fortune she loved another, the other was represented and not him, and because she discovered the deceptions of the lovers, she was called the truth of love. At the other of the squares was the cave of Damon and Fortune, and at the last, the lair of old Mandrag, full of so many rarities and so many spells that, from hour to time, something new always happened, besides that, by all the rest of the wood, there were several other various caves, so well counterfeited with the natural that the eye often deceived the judgment. Now it was in this garden that the nymph came for a walk waiting for the awakening of the shepherd, and because these new desires could not allow her to remain silent, she pretended to have forgotten something which she commanded Sylvie to fetch, especially since she trusted less in her for her youth than in Leonidas, who was of a more mature age, although her two nymphs were her most secret confidants, and seeing herself alone with Leonidas, she said to him, What do you think, Leonid, doesn't this druid have a great knowledge of things, and do not the gods communicate well freely with him, since what is future to each one is better known to him than to us the present, without lying? replied the nymph, he made you see in the mirror the very place where you found this shepherd, and told you well the time you met him there, but his words were so doubtful that it is uneasy to believe that he himself could hear himself well. And how do you say that, replied Galathi, since he tells me so particularly all that I have found there, that I cannot at this hour say more than he can. If it seems to me, replied Leonides, let him only tell you that you would find in that place something of inestimable value, though in the past it had been disdained. Galathi then, mocking her, said to her, What, Leonides, you know nothing else, you must hear that he said to me in particular, Madam, you have two very opposite influences, one, the most unfortunate under heaven, the other the happiest one can desire, and it depends on your election to take the one you want, and so that you are not mistaken, know that you are and will be served by several great knights whose virtues and merits can move you in many different ways. But, if you measure your affection or their merits, or the judgment you will make of their love, and not of what I will tell you about it on behalf of the great gods, I predict that you will be the most wretched who lives, and so that you may not be disappointed in your election, remember that on such a day you will see at Marsilia knight, dressed in such color, who seeks or will seek to marry you, for, if you permit, from here I pity your misfortune, and cannot threaten you enough with the incredible disasters that await you, and thus I advise you to flee such a man, whom you must rather call your misfortune than your lover, and on the contrary, take a good look at the place that is represented in this mirror, so that you know how to find it along the banks of Lignon, for on such a day, at such an hour, you shall meet there a man in whose friendship heaven has put all your bliss. If you make him love you, do not believe the true gods if you can wish for more contentment than you will have, but beware that the first of you who will see the other will be the one who will love the first. Does it seem to you that it is not speaking to me very clearly, and even that I already feel true his predictions which he has made to me? For, having seen this shepherd first, I must not lie about it, it seems to me to recognize in me some spark of goodwill for him. How, madam, said Leonid, would you like to love a shepherd, don't you remember who you are? If done, Leonides, I remember it, she said, but you must also know that the shepherds are men as well as the druids and the knights, and that their nobility is as great as that of the others, having all come from seniority of the same stem, that the exercise in which we indulge cannot make us other than we are of our birth, so that, if this shepherd is well born, why should I not believe him as worthy of me as any other? Finally, madam, she said, he is a shepherd, as you wished to disguise him. Finally, said Galathi, he is an honest man, as you may call him. But, madam, replied Leonides, you are so great nymph, lady after Amasus of all these beautiful lands, will you have the courage so dejected to love a man born of the midst of the people, a rustic, a burgher, a man of nothing? My dear, replied Galathi, let us leave these insults, and you remember that Oenone made himself a shepherdess for Paris, and that, having lost him, she regretted him and wept hot tears. Madam, said Leonides, that one was the son of a king, and then the error of others must not make you fall into such a fault. If it is fault, I entrust myself to the gods, who advise me by the oracle of their druid, but let Celadon not be born of as good blood as Paris, my dear, you have no spirit if you say so, for did they not both come from the same origin? 
and then haven't you heard what Sylvie said about him and his father, you must know that they are not shepherds in order to have nothing to live otherwise, but to buy themselves by this sweet life an honest rest, and what, madam, added Leonid, will you forget by thus the affection and services of the kind Lindama, I would not, said Galathi, an oversight be the reward for his services, but I would not wish the friendship I could repay him to be the complete ruin of all my contentments. Ah! Madam, said Leonides, remember how faithful he was, oh! My dear, said Galathi, consider it to be eternally unhappy, as for me, replied Leonides, I bend my shoulders to these judgments of love, and know what to say, except extreme affection, complete fidelity, the employment of a whole age, and continual service, were not to receive for so long, or, received, deserved to be paid in any other currency than by an exchange. For God, madam, consider how deceitful are those who say the fortune of others, since most often it is only slight imaginations that their dreams bring them. How many liars, since of the hundred accidents they predict, there is hardly one that happens. How ignorant, since meddling in knowing the happiness of others, they do not know how to find their own, and do not want, for the fantastic speeches of this man, to make so miserable a person who is so much yours, put yourself before your eyes how much he loves you, what chance he has put himself for you, what a fight was that of Polemas, and what despair was during his, what pains you prepare for him at this hour, and what deaths you will force him to invent to get rid of, if he has the knowledge of it. Galathi, shaking his head, replied, You see, Leonides, this is not the election of Lindama or Polma as before, but that of all my good or all my evil, the considerations you have are very good for you, to whom my misfortune would touch only by compassion, but for me they are too dangerous, since it is not for a day but forever that this misfortune threatens me, if I were in your place and you in mine, perhaps I would advise you the very thing you advise, but certainly an eternal misfortune terrifies me, as for the lies of these people that you say, I am willing to believe, for your sake, that maybe it will not happen, but maybe it will happen and tell me, I beg you, would you believe a prudent person, who, for the satisfaction of others, would let swing on a perhaps all his good or all his evil, if you love me, never give me this speech, or else I will believe that you cherish Lindama's contentment more than mine, and as for him, do not doubt that he consoles himself by no other means than by death, for reason and time always prevail over this fury, and indeed, how many have you seen of those so desperate for such occasions who, not long after, repented of their despair. These beautiful nymphs were thus speaking, when from afar they saw Sylvie return, from whom, to be too young, the lady went into hiding as I have said. This was the cause of her cutting her speech rather short, yet she did not let Leonid say, If you have loved me sometimes, you will make it appear to me at this hour, that not only is it my contentment but all my bliss at stake. Leonid could not answer him, because Sylvia was so close to them, that she had heard their speeches. Having arrived, Galathi knew that Celadon was awake, for from the door she had heard him pity and sigh, and it was true, especially since some time after they had come out of his room, he awoke with a start, and because the sun through the windows gave full on his bed, at the opening of his eyes, he remained so dazzled that, confused in such great light, he did not know where he was. The work of the past day had stunned him, but at the hour there was no pain left for him, so that remembering his fall into Lignon, and the opinion he had had shortly before to be dead, seeing himself now in this confused light, he knew only to judge, except that love would have taken him to heaven as a reward for his fidelity, and what deceived him more in this opinion was that, when his eyesight began to strengthen, he saw around him only enrichments of gold and brilliant paintings, of which the room was all adorned, and which his weak eye still could not recognize as counterfeit. On one side, he saw Saturn leaning on his scythe, with long hair, wrinkled forehead, chaste eyes, aquiline nose, and mouth dripping with blood, and still full of a piece of his children, of which he had one, half eaten, in his left hand, which, by the opening he had made to his side with his teeth, it was seen as panting the lungs and trembling the heart, seen in truth full of cruelty, for this little child had his head thrown back on his shoulders, his arms leaning in front, and his legs widened from one side and the other, all blushing with the blood that came out of the wound that this old man had made him, whose beard was long and chenued, in many places was stained with the drops of blood that fell from the piece he was trying to swallow. His nervous, filthy arms and legs were, in various places, 
covered with hair as well as his skinny and emaciated thighs, beneath his feet rose great pieces of bones, some of which whitened with old age, others were only beginning to be emaciated, and others, joined with a little skin and half-spoiled flesh, showed that they had only recently been put in this place. Around him there were only scepters in pieces, crowns broken, great ruined buildings, and this in such a way that scarcely any slight resemblance of what it had been. A little further, we saw the Corybants, with their symbols and oboes, hiding the little Jupiter in a cave of the devouring teeth of this father. Then, quite close by, he was seen tall, with a face inflamed, but grave and full of majesty, his eyes benign but formidable, the crown on his head, in his left hand, the scepter which he pressed on his thigh, where one could still see the scar of the wound he had made when, for the imprudence of the Semele nymph, in order to save little Bacchus, he was compelled to open this place and carry it there until the end of the term. With the other hand, he had the three-pointed lightning, which was so well represented that it even seemed to fly already through the air. He had his feet on a great world, and near him was seen a great eagle who carried in his hooked beak a lightning, and approached him, raising his head against him, as close as possible to his knee. On the back of this bird was the little Ganymede, dressed in the manner of the inhabitants of Mount Ida, fat, chubby, white, with golden and curly hair, who, with one hand caressed the head of this bird, and with the other tried to take the lightning of that of Jupiter, who, with his elbow and not otherwise, nonchalantly repelled his weak arm. A little beside them, they saw the cup, and the ewer of which this little butler poured the nectar to his master, so well represented, that, especially as this little annoyance, trying to reach with the hand of Jupiter, had touched her with one foot, it seemed that she staggered to fall, and that the little one had expressly turned his head to see what would become of it. On each side of the feet of this god, one could see a great barrel, on the right side, it was that of good, and on the other, was that of evil, and around the vows, prayers, sacrifices were variously depicted, for the sacrifices were represented by smoke intermingled with fire, and within, the vows and supplications seemed as light ideas, and scarcely marked, so that the eye could recognize them. It would be too long a speech to tell all these paintings especially, so much so that the turn of the room was full of them. Even Venus, in her conch shell, among other things, was still looking at the wound that the Greek made her in the Trojan War, and we could see everything against the little Cupid who caressed her, with the wound on her shoulder, of the lamp of the curious Psyche, and this so well represented that the shepherd could not discern it for counterfeiting, and when he was further in this thought, the three nymphs entered his room, the beauty and majesty of which delighted him still more in admiration, but what persuaded him much better the opinion he had of being dead was that, seeing these nymphs, he took them for the three graces, and even seeing little Merrill enter with them, whose height, youth, beauty, curly hair and pretty manner made him judge that it was love, and though he was confused in himself, if this courage, which he always had greater than the name of shepherd required, gave him the assurance, after having greeted them, to ask in what place he was, to which Galathi replied, Celadon, you are in a place where it is intended to heal you entirely, we are the ones who, finding you in the water, have carried you here where you have all power, then Sylvie came forward, and what, Celadon, she said, is it possible that you do not know me, don't you remember seeing me in your hamlet, I do not know, replied Celadon, a beautiful nymph, whether the state in which I am will excuse the weakness of my memory, how, said the nymph, do you not remember that the nymph Sylvie and two of her companions went to see your sacrifices and games on the day you were working with the goddess Venus, did the accident that happened to you make you forget that after you had won all your companions in the race, Sylvie was the one who gave you as a prize a hat of flowers that incontinent you put on your head to the shepherdess astray. I do not know if all these things are erased from your memory, so I know well that when you wore my garland on the beautiful hair of astray, everyone was surprised, because of the enmity that existed between your two families, and especially between Alcipi, your father, and Alce, father of astray and even when I wanted to know the opportunity, but it was confused to me so that I could not know anything else, except that Amaryllis having been loved by these two shepherds, and that between the rivals there is always little friendship, they came several times to the hands, until Amaryllis had married your father, and then Alce and the wise Hippolytus, that since then he married, married together such a cruel hatred against them, that it never allowed them to practice together. Now see, Celadon, if I do not know you well, 
and if I do not give you good signs of what I say. The shepherd, hearing these words, went little by little to remember what she said, and yet he was so astonished that he could not answer her, for knowing Sylvie only for nymph of Amasus, and because of his country life, having no familiarity with her, nor with his companions, he could not judge why, nor how, he was among them at this hour. At last he answered, What you tell me, fair nymph, is very true, and I remember that on the day of Venus, three nymphs gave the three prizes, of which I had that of the race, Lycidas, my brother, that of jumping, which he gave to Phyllis, and Sylvander that of singing, which he presented to the daughter of the wise Belinde. But to remember the names they had, I would not know, especially since we were so prevented in our games that we contented ourselves with knowing that they were nymphs of Amasus and Galathi, for as for us, just as our bodies do not come out of pastures and woods, so do our minds not very curious, and since then, replied Galathi, have you not known anything about it? What has given me more knowledge, replied the shepherd, was the speech which my father has often made to me of his fortunes, among which I have several times heard him mention Amasus, but not of any peculiarity which touches it, although I have desired it. This desire, resumed Galathi, is too laudable not to satisfy him, that is why I want to tell you especially, and who is Amasus, and who we are. Know then, gentle shepherd, that, of all antiquity, this country which is called at that hour Ferez was covered with great abysses of water, and that there were only the high mountains that you see around that were discovered, except for a few points in the middle of the plain, like the pitfall of the wood of Isaur and Mont Verdun, so that the inhabitants all dwelt on the top of the mountains. And that is why still the ancient families of this country have the buildings of their names on the highest places, and in the highest mountains, and as proof of what I say you still see at the cups of Isaur, Mont Verdun, and around the Chateau de Marsili, large iron rings planted in the rock where the ships were attached, not having any appearance that they could be used for anything else. But there may be fourteen or fifteen centuries, that a Roman stranger, who in ten years conquered all Gaul, broke some mountains through which these waters flowed, and soon after was discovered the bosom of our plains which seemed to him so pleasant and fertile that he deliberated to make them inhabit, and for this purpose, sent down all those who lived in the mountains and in the forests, and willed that the first building that was made there, should bear the name of Julius, like him. And because the wet and silty plain threw away a great quantity of trees, some said that the country was called Forez, and the Forzian peoples, instead of that, previously, they were called Seguzians. But these are very disappointed, because the name of Forez comes from Forum which is Furs, a small town that the Romans had built, and which they named Forum Seguignorum, as if they had meant the place or the market of the Seguzians, which, properly, was only the place where they held their armies during the time they put order to the neighboring countries. This, Celadon, is what is taken for granted of the antiquity of this province, but there are two contrary opinions of what I am about to tell you. The Romans say that when our plain was still covered with water, the chaste goddess Diana had it so pleasant that she dwelt there almost ordinarily, for her dryads and hamadryads lived and hunted in these great woods and high mountains which surrounded this great quantity of waters, and because it was only springs of fountains, she often came there to bathe with her naiads who ordinarily dwelt there. But when the waters flowed, the naiads were compelled to follow them and go with them into the bosom of the ocean, so that the goddess was suddenly diminished by half of her nymphs, and this was the cause that, not being able, with so small a choir, to continue her ordinary pastimes, she elected some daughters of the principal druids and knights, whom she joined with the nymphs who had remained to her, to whom she also gave the name of nymph. But it happened, as at last abuse perverts all order, that several of them, who had from youth been nourished in their homes, some between the conveniences of an amiable mother, the others between the alleges of sighs and services of the lovers, not being able to continue the sorrows of the hunt, nor banish from their memory the honest affections of those who had formerly sought them, wanted to retire to their homes and marry. Some others, to whom the goddess refused leave, failed in their promises and honesty, whereupon she was so irritated that she resolved to distance this country, desecrated, it seemed to her, from that vice which she abhorred so strongly. But, in order not to punish the virtue of some with the error of others, before leaving, she drove ignominiously away, and banished forever from the country all those who had failed, and elected one of the others, to whom she gave the same authority as she had over the whole country, and willed that forever the race of that one should have all power, and henceforth allowed them to marry, 
with very expressed offenses that men would never succeed them. Since that time, there has been no abuse between us, and our laws have always been inviolably observed, but our druids speak of the other way, for they say that our great princess Galathea, daughter of the Celtic king, wife of the great Hercules, and mother of Galathea, who gave her name to the Gauls who were formerly called Celts, full of love for her husband, followed him wherever his courage and virtue carried him against the monsters and against the giants, and of fortune, at that time, these mountains which separate us from the Auvergne, and those which are more there in the left hand, which are called Semene and Jeben, served as a retreat to some giants, who, by their strength made themselves formidable to each. Hercules, being warned, came there, and because he loved his dear Galathi dearly, he left her in that country which was the nearest one, and where she took great pleasure, was hunting, was in the company of the daughters of the country, and because she was queen of all Gaul, when Hercules had defeated the giants and the necessity of his affairs compelled him to go elsewhere, before leaving, to leave an eternal memory of the pleasure she had had in this land, she ordered what the Romans say the goddess Diana had done. But, whether Galathi or Diana, so much so, by a supernatural privilege, we have been particularly kept in our franchises, since of so many peoples who like torrents are melted over Gaul, there has not been one that has troubled us in our rest. Even Alaric, king of the Visigoths, when he conquered, with Aquitaine, all the provinces of the Loire, having known our statutes, reconfirmed their privileges, and without usurping any authority over us, left us in our old franchises. You may find it strange that I speak to you especially of things which are besides the capacity of those of my age, but you must know that Pimander, who was my father, was curious to search for the antiquities of this country, so that the most learned druids usually told him during the meal, and I, who was almost always at his side, retained what I liked most, and so I knew that from a continued line, Amasus, my mother, had descended from that which the goddess Diana or Galathi had elected, and wherefore, being lady of all these lands, and still having a son named Clidamon, she nourishes with us many daughters and young sons of the druids and knights, who, to be in such a good school, learn all the virtues that their age can allow. The girls go dressed as you see us, which is a kind of dress that Diane or Galathi used to wear, and that we have always kept in memory of her. This, Celadon, is what you wanted to know about our state, and assures me, before you depart us, for I want you to see us all together, that you will say our assembly yields to no other either in virtue or in beauty. Then Celadon, knowing who these beautiful nymphs were, also recognized what respect he owed them, and though he would not have been accustomed to be elsewhere than between shepherds, his fellows, if the good birth he had taught him enough what he owed to such persons, so, after having restored to them the honor to which he thought he was obliged, but, he continued, I cannot be astonished enough to see myself among so many great nymphs, I, who am but a simple shepherd, and to receive from them so many favors. Celadon, replied Galathea, wherever virtue may be, she deserves to be loved and honored, both in the garments of the shepherds and in the glorious purple of kings, and, for your particular, you are not to us in lesser consideration than the greatest of the druids or knights of our court, for you must yield to them in favor, since you do not do it in merit. And, as to what you see among us, know that it is not without a great mystery of our gods who have thus commanded us, as you will know at leisure, either that they no longer want so many virtues to remain wild between the forests and the rural places, or that they make design, by making yourself greater than you are, to make by you blessed a person who loves you, live only in rest, and you heal, for there is nothing you can desire in the state you are in but health. Madam, replied the shepherd, who did not hear these words well, if I must desire health, the chief subject is to be able to render you some service, in exchange for so many graces that you are pleased to do me. It is true that, as I am, it must not be spoken that I come out of the woods or our pastures, otherwise the solemn vow which our fathers made to the gods would accuse us towards them of being unworthy children of such fathers. And what is this oath? replied the nymph. The story, replied Celadon, would be too long, if I had to repeat the subject which my father, Alcippe, had to continue it. So much so, madam, that several years ago, by general agreement, all those who were along the banks of the Loire, Furon, Argent, and all these other rivers, after having well recognized the inconveniences which the ambition of a people named Roman made their neighbors feel for the desire to dominate, assembled in this great plain, who is around Montverdune, and, by mutual consent, 
all swore to flee forever from all kinds of ambition, since it alone was the cause of so much sorrow, and to live, them and theirs, with the peaceful habit of shepherds, and since then has been noticed, so pleased have the gods been this vow, that none of those who have made it or of their successors, has had only incredible labors and sorrows if he has not observed it, and of all, my father is the most remarkable and new example, so that, having known that the will of heaven was to keep us at rest what we have to live, we have again ratified this vow, with so many oaths, that he who would break it would be too detestable. Really, replied the nymph, I am very glad to hear what you are telling me, for it has been a long time since I heard of it, and have not yet been able to know why so many good and ancient families, as I might say there were between you, were amusing themselves outside the cities by spending their age between woods and solitary places. But, Celadon, if the state in which you are, you can allow it, tell me, I pray you, what was the fortune of your father, Alcippe, to make him resume the kind of life which he had so long left, for I assure myself that the speech deserves to be known. Then, though the shepherd still felt ill from the water he had swallowed, if he constrained himself to obey him, and began in this way, History of Alcippe, you command me, madam, to tell you the most traversed and diverse fortune of man in the world, and in which it may well be learned that he who wants to give trouble to others prepares the most great part. However, since you want it so, so as not to disobey you, I will tell you briefly what I have learned from it by the ordinary speeches of the very one to whom all these things have happened, for, to make us hear how happy we were to live in rest of mind, my father often told us of his strange fortunes. Know then, madam, that Alcippe, having been fed by his father with the simplicity of a shepherd, always had a spirit so distant from his food that everything else pleased him more than what smelled of the village, so that, as a young child, to foreshadow what he would succeed, and to what, being of age, he would indulge, he had so great pleasure as to make assemblies of other children as well as himself, to whom he learned to put himself in order, and armed them some with fronds, others with bows and arrows, from which he showed them to shoot justly, without the threats of the old and wise shepherds being able to divert him from it. The elders of our hamlets, who saw his actions, predicted great troubles by these lands, and especially that Alcippe would be a turbulent spirit that would never stop in the words of the shepherd. When he began to reach half a century of his age, of fortune, he fell in love with the shepherdess Amaryllis, who, for then on, was secretly sought by another shepherd his neighbor, named Alce. And because Alcippe had such a good opinion of himself that there seemed to him to be no shepherdess who did not receive her affection as freely as he would offer her, he resolved not to use much artifice to declare it to her, so that, meeting her at one of Pan's sacrifices, as she returned to her hamlet, he said to him, I never thought I had so little strength as not to be able to resist the blows of an enemy who wounds me without thinking. She replied, He who wounds by mischief must not have the name of enemy. Not, he replied, in those who do not stop at effects, but only at words, but as for me, I find that he who offends as it is is an enemy, and that is why I can give you this name. To me, she replied. I would not want to have the effect or the thought, for I make too much of your merit. That, added the shepherd, is one of those blows of which you most offend me by telling me one thing for another. That if, truly, you recognized in me what you say, as much as I consider myself outraged by you, I might as well say that I favored it, but I see that it is enough for you to bring love to your eyes and mouth, without giving it a place in your heart. The shepherdess then, finding herself surprised, as if she had not heard of love, replied, I declare, Alcippe, your virtue as I must, and not beyond my duty, and as for what you speak of love, believe that I do not want to have it in my eyes or in my heart for anyone, and less for those lowered spirits who live like savages in the woods. I know well, replied the shepherd, that it is not the election of love, but my destiny, which makes me to be yours, since, if love is to be born of resemblance of mood, it would be very difficult if Alcippe had none for you, who, from the cradle, had in hatred that country life which you despise so strongly, and protest to you, if it is only necessary to change my condition to share in your good graces, that from here I leave the houlette and the flocks, and want to live among men, and not between savages. You may well, replied Amaryllis, change your condition, but not make me change it, being resolved never to be less mine than I am, to give way to some stronger affection. If you want us to continue to live as we have done in the past, change these speeches of affection and love into those that you once told me, 
or do not find it strange that I banish myself from your presence, being impossible that love and the honesty of Amaryllis can remain together. Alcipi, who had not expected such an answer, seeing himself so far from his thought, was so confused in himself that he remained for some time without being able to answer her. At last, having returned, he tried to persuade himself that the shame of his age and sex, and not for lack of goodwill towards him, had made him say such words. Wherefore he answered him, Whatever you may be me, I will never be other than your servant, and if the commandment you make to me was not incompatible with my affection, you must believe that there is nothing in the world that could make me contravene it. You will therefore excuse me, and allow me to continue this design, which is only a testimony of your merit, and to which, whether you like it or not, I am entirely resolute. The shepherdess gently turned her eye towards him, I do not know, Alcipi, she said to him, whether it is out of gamble or obstinacy that you speak of this kind. It is, he replied, by both of them, for I have gambled with my desires to defeat you or to die, and this resolution has been changed into obstinacy, having nothing to entertain me from the oath I have made of it. I would be very pleased, replied Amaryllis, if you had taken some other object to such importunity. You will name my affections as you please, said the shepherd, this cannot however make me change my design. Do not find it evil, replied Amaryllis, if I am as firm in my obstinacy as you are in your importunity. The shepherd wanted to reply, but he was interrupted by several shepherdesses who appeared, so that Amaryllis, in conclusion, said to him rather low, You will displease me, Alcipi, if your deliberation is known, for I am content to know your follies, and would be too displeased if some other heard them. Thus ended the first speeches of my father and Amaryllis, which only increased his desire to serve her, for nothing gives so much love as honesty, and makeshift along the way, this troop met Celine and Belinde, who had stopped to contemplate two turtle doves who seemed to caress and make love to each other, without caring to see around them so many people. Then Alcipi, remembering the command that Amaryllis had just given him, could not help sighing such verses, and because his voice was good enough, everyone fell silent to listen to him. Sonnet and the Constraints of Honor Dear birds of Venus, amiable turtle doves, who endlessly redouble your loving kisses, and let it will renew by them all your sweet peace, your sweet quarrels, when I see you languishing, and shaking your wings, as delighted with the ease where you are both, my God, that towards us I consider you happy to freely enjoy your faithful loves. You are fortunate to be able frankly to show what we must hide so finely by the unjust laws that this honor gives us, feigned honor that makes us enemies of ourselves, for the cruel that he is, without reason, he commands that in love only theft be permitted. Since that time, Alcipi allowed herself to be so carried away to her affection that there was no limit that he did not overstep, and she, on the contrary, was always colder and more frozen towards him. And on this subject, one day when he was asked to sing, he said such verses, madrigal on the coldness of Amaryllis, she has a heart of ice, and her eyes all aflame, and I, in reverse, freeze outside, and I always carry the fire in my soul. Alas! It is that Lavia chosen for stay of my heart and the eyes of my beautiful shepherdess. God, will he not sometimes change his design, and that I have it in the eyes, and that she has it in the breast? At that time, as I told you, Alcée was looking for Amaryllis, and because he was a very honest shepherd, and who was considered very wise, Amaryllis' father was more inclined to yawn it to him than not to Alcipi, because of his turbulent courage. And on the contrary, the shepherdess loved my father more, because her mood was closer to his, which the wise father well recognized, and not wishing to use violence or absolute authority towards her, he had opinion that distance might entertain her from this will, and thus resolved to send him for some time to Artemis, sister of Alce, who stood on the banks of the river Olye. When Amaryllis learned of her father's deliberation, as always one strives against the things forbidden, she resolved not to leave without assuring Alcipi of his good will. For this purpose, she wrote to him such words. Letter from Amaryllis to Alcipi. Your obstinacy has surpassed mine, but mine too will overcome the one that compels me to warn you that tomorrow I am leaving, and that today, if you find yourself on the path where we met the day before yesterday, and your love can be content with words, it will have occasion to be, and farewell, it would be too long, madam, to tell you all that happened particularly between them, besides the fact that the state in which I find myself prevents me from being able to do so, it will therefore be enough for me, in short, 
to tell you that they met in the same place, and that this was the first place where my father was assured of being loved by Amaryllis, and that she advised him to leave the country life where he had been fed, because she despised her as unworthy of noble courage, promising him that there was nothing strong enough to entertain her of her resolution. After they were separated, Alcipi carved such verses on a tree along the wood, sonnet, of Alcipi on the constancy of his friendship, Amaryllis, full of grace, went these edges of these flowers stripping, but, under the hand that went to pick them, others suddenly reborn in their place, these beautiful hairs, where love intertwines, love went with a sweet awakening air, and if he sees someone scattering, all curious suddenly he picks it up, such lean yon to see her stopped, and for mirror her waters presented her, and then said to him, such a beautiful image at your departure my wave will go away, but from my heart never will the fatal trait, nymph, of your face leave. When she had gone, and he began wisely to feel the displeasures of her absence, often going to the same place where he had taken leave of his shepherdess, he sighed there several times such verses, sonnet. On her absence, river of Lignon whose eternal course of the graceful Ferez goes the watering breast, and who, flow over stream, will not rest that you have not returned in the paternal wave, do you not see Olye, who, ravishing your beautiful, use as outrageous of the laws of the most powerful, and honour, from your edges far from you ravishing, obliges you to undertake a just quarrel. Against this kidnapper calls for your help those who, for his departure, shed every day the tears you see flooding your shore. Dare only it, and our eyes and hearts will pour out to help you a thousand rivers of weeping, which will only dry up by avenging your outrage. But, not being able to live without seeing her in the same place where he had so accustomed the good of his sight, he resolved, as it was, to depart from there, and when he sought the opportunity, he presented himself with one as he would have known to desire. Shortly before, Amasa's mother had died, and preparations were being made in the big city, de Marsili to receive her as the new lady with much triumph, and because the preparations made there attracted almost the whole country out of curiosity, my father arranged for him to be discharged from going, and it was from this that the beginning of all his work came. He was half a century and a few moons, the face handsome among all those of this country, the blonde hair, ringed and craped of nature, which he wore quite long, and in short, madam, it was such that love wanted perhaps to make some secret revenge, and this is how, he was seen by some lady, and so secretly loved by her, that we have never been able to know her name. At the beginning when he arrived at Marsili, he was dressed as a shepherd, but quite neatly, for his father cherished him very much, and so that he did not make some folly, as he had accustomed in his hamlet, he put two or three shepherds near him, who had the care, chiefly one named Clent, a man to whom the mood of my father pleased, so that he loved her as if he had been her son. This Clent had one named Clinda, of my father's age, who seemed to have had the same inclination to love Alcipi. Alcipi, who on the other hand recognized this affection, loved him more than any other, which was so pleasing to Clent that he had nothing he could refuse to my father. This was caused that after seeing a few days like the young, knights who were at these feasts went dressed, as they armed themselves and fought at the barrier, and having declared his purpose to his friend Clinda, both together require Clent to give them the means to make themselves appear between these knights. And how, said Clent, do you have the courage to match them? And why not, said Alcipi, don't I have as many arms and legs as they do? But, said Clent, you have not learned the civilities of cities. We have not learned them, said he, but they are not so difficult that they must take away our hope of learning them soon, and then, it seems to me that there is not so much difference from these to ours as we change them very easily. You don't have, he said, the address to arms. We have, he replied, enough courage to make up for this defect. And what, added Clent, would you like to leave country life, and what are the woods with men, replied Alcipi and what can men learn from the practice of beasts? But, replied Clent, it will be to your displeasure to see yourselves disdained by these glorious courtiers, who, at every stroke, will reproach you that you are shepherds. If it is shameful, said Alcipi, to be a shepherd, you must no longer be one, if it is not shameful, the reproach cannot be bad, that if they despise me for this name, I will try by my actions to be esteemed. Finally, Clent seeing them so determined to make another life than that of their fathers, well, said he, my children, since you have made this resolution, I will tell you that, though you are considered shepherds, your birth, 
however, comes from the oldest stems of this country, and from which as many brave knights have come out as from any other in Gaul, but a consideration contrary to that which you have made them elect this life withdrawn, so do not fear that you will be well received between these knights, the principal of which are even of your blood. These words only served to make their desire more ardent, for this knowledge made them more inclined to put in effect their resolution, without considering what might happen to them, even by the inconveniences which such a life brings, or by the displeasure which Alcippe's father and his parents would receive. From the hour Clent spent all that was necessary for them, they were both so well born that they soon gained the knowledge and friendship of all the principals, and Alcippe, at the same time, so devoted himself to weapons that he succeeded in one of the good knights of his time. During these feasts, which continued two moons, my father was seen, as I have told you, of a lady, whose name I have never been able to know, and because he did not fail her any of those things that can make one love, she was so enamoured that she invented a ruse good enough to overcome her intention. One day when my father was witnessing in a temple the sacrifices that were being made for Amasus, a rather old woman came to stand near him, and, pretending to make her prayers, she said to him two or three times, Alcippe, Alcippe, without looking at him. He, who heard himself named, wanted to ask her what she wanted, but seeing her eyes turned elsewhere, he thought she was talking to another. She, who noticed that he was listening to her, continued, Alcippe, it is to you to whom I speak, although I do not look at you. If you wish to have the finest fortune that knight ever had in this court, find yourself between day and night at the crossroads that leads to the place of Pallas, and there you will know of me the rest. Alcippe, seeing that she was talking to him in this way, without looking at her too, replied that he would be there, to which he did not fail, for, as evening approached, he went to the place assigned, where it was not long before this elderly woman came to him, almost covered with a taffeta which she had on her head, and, having pulled him aside, said to her, Young man, you are the happiest who lives, being loved by the most beautiful and amiable lady of this court, and from which, if thou wilt promise me what I will ask of thee, from this hour I oblige myself to make thee have every sort of contentment. The young Alcippe, hearing this proposal, asked who the lady was. That, said she, is the first thing I want you to promise me, which is not to inquire into his name, and to keep this fortune secret, the other, that you allow me to close your eyes when I lead you to where she is. Alcippe said to him, to inquire not into his name, and to keep this matter secret, I shall do very willingly, but to close my eyes, will never allow it. And what do you want to fear? She said. I fear nothing, replied Alcippe, but I want to have my eyes free. Oh young man, said the old woman, that you are still an apprentice. Why do you want to displease a person who loves you so much? And isn't it displeasing to her to want to know more about her than she wants? Believe me, do not make any difficulty, do not doubt anything, what danger can there be for you? Where is this courage that your presence promises at first? Is it possible that an imagined peril makes you leave a property insured, and seeing that he was not moved by it, let the mother be cursed, said she, who made you so beautiful, and so little bold, no doubt, and your face and your courage are more like women than what you are. Young Alcippe could not hear the words of this angry old woman without laughing. At last, after having thought for some time in himself what enemy he might have, and finding that he had none, he resolved to go, provided that she would allow him to carry his sword, and so she let her eyes be closed, and, taking her by the dress, followed her where she would lead, I would be too long if I told you, madam, all the peculiarities of that night, so much so that after several detours, and having perhaps passed several times on the same path, he found himself in a room, where, blindfolded, he was stripped naked by the same woman, and put in a bed. Soon after, came the lady who had sent for him, and, placing herself beside him, opened his eyes, because there was no light in the room. But, however much trouble he took in it, he never knew how to draw a single word from her, so that he got up in the morning without knowing who she was, only he judged her beautiful and young, and an hour before the day, she who had brought him came to take him back, and drove him back with the same ceremonies. From that day on, they resolved together that whenever he had to return, he would find a stone at a certain crossroads in the morning. However, as these things were happening, the father of Alcippe came to die, so that he remained more master of himself than he could have been, 
and had it not been for the command of Amaryllis and his particular intention which kept him there, the love he bore to his shepherdess would perhaps have recalled him to the woods, for the favors of this unknown lady could in no way deprive him of the memory, that if the great gifts which he ordinarily received from her had not restrained him in this practice, after the first two or three voyages he had withdrawn from them, though it seemed that since that time he entered into favor with Pimander and Amasus, but, because a young heart can uneasily hold something hidden for a long time, it happened that Clinda, his dear friend, seeing him spending more than usual, asked him where the means came from, to which at first glance answering very variously, at last he discovered to her all this fortune, and then told her that, whatever artifice he had been able to put into it, he had never been able to know who she was. Clinda, too curious, advised him to cut half a foot off the fringe of the bed, and that the next day he should follow the best houses he could suspect, and that he would recognize it either by color or by room, which he did, and, by this artifice, my father became acquainted with the one who favored him. However, he kept the name so secret that neither Clinda, nor any of his children, ever knew anything about it. But the first time he returned, when he was ready to get up in the morning, he conjured her not to hide from him any more, that it might as well be a wasted effort, since he certainly knew that she was such. She, hearing her name, was about to speak, yet she was silent, and waited until the old woman had come, to whom, when Alcippe was out of bed, she made so many threats, believing that it was she who had discovered her, that this poor woman came trembling to swear to my father that he was mistaken. He then, smiling, told her of the finesse he had used, and that it had been Clinda's invention. She, very pleased with what he had discovered to her, after a thousand oaths to the contrary, returned to tell this lady, who had even risen to hear the speeches, and when she knew that Clinda had invented it, she turned all her anger against him, easily forgiving Alcippe, whom she could not hate, however, from that day on she did not send him any further, and because an offended mind has nothing so sweet as vengeance, this woman turned so many sides that she made a quarrel with Clinda, for which he was compelled to fight against a cousin of Pimander, whom he killed, and though he was pursued, if he fled to Auvergne with the help of Alcippe, but Amasus caused Alaric, king of the Visigoths, being for then in Toulouse, to put him prisoner at Usson, with command to his officers to hand him over into the hands of Pimander, who was waiting to have the convenience of sending him to die. Alcippe left nothing to be sued to obtain his pardon, but it was in vain, for he had too strong a part. Therefore, seeing the assured loss of his friend, he deliberated, by any chance, to save him. He was then in Usson, as I told you, a place so strong that it would have seemed to any other a folly to want to undertake to get him out of it. His friendship, however, which found nothing more difficult than living without Clinda, caused him to resolve to preempt those who went on Pimander's behalf. Thus, pretending to retire home unhappy, he departed, twelfth, and, one market day, presented himself at the gate of the castle, all dressed as villagers, and carrying short swords under their skirts, on the arms of baskets as persons who were going to sell. I heard him say that there were three fortresses within each other, these resolute peasants came to the last, where few Visigoths had remained, for most had gone down to the lower town to see the market, and to procure what was necessary for their garrison. Being there, they offered their goods so cheaply that almost everyone who was in it went out to buy it. Then my father, seeing the good opportunity, seizing at the collar the one who guarded the door, put the sword in his body, and each of his companions like him at the same moment undid his, and, entering into it, put the rest to the thread of the sword, and suddenly, clutching the door, ran to the prisons, where they found Clinda in a dungeon, and so many others, that they judged themselves, being armed, sufficient to defeat the rest of the garrison. To make it short, I will tell you, madam, that although, for the alarm, the gates of the city were closed, if they forced them without losing a single man, though the governor, who was at last killed there, made all the resistance he could. So here was Clinda saved, and Alaric warned that it was my father who had done this enterprise, whereupon he felt so offended that he asked Amasus for justice, and she, who did not want to lose her friendship, was very fond of satisfying him, sent incontinent to seize my father. But his friends warned him so apt that, having ordered his affairs, he went out of this country, and stung against Alaric more than he is unbelievable, went to put himself with a nation, which had recently entered our Gauls, and which, to be belligerent, had seized both banks of the Rhone and the Arar, 
and part of the Allobroges, and because, desiring to enlarge their lands, they continually waged war on the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, and Romans, he was very well received there with all those he wished to lead there, and, being known as a man of valor, was incontinent honored with various offices. But, a few years having passed, Gondioc, king of this nation coming to die, Gondibord, his son, succeeded to the crown of Burgundy, and, desiring to ensure his affairs from the beginning, made peace with his neighbors, marrying his son Sigismund with one of the daughters of Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, and, to please Alaric, who was infinitely offended against Alcipi, promised not to hold him with him any more, so that with his leave he withdrew with another people, who, on the side of Wren, had seized a part of Gaul in spite of the Gauls and Romans. But, madam, this speech would be boring to you if, especially, I told you all his travels, for of these he was compelled to go to London, to the great King Arthur, who, at the same time, as I have since heard him tell several times, instituted the order of the Knights of the Round Table. From there, he was forced to retire to the kingdom which bears the name of the Port of the Gauls. And finally, being sought by Alaric, he resolved to cross the sea and go to Byzantz, where the emperor gave him the charge of his galleys. But especially since the desire to return to the country is the strongest of all the others, my father, though very great with these great emperors, had nothing more at heart than to see his home smoked again, where so often he had been swaddled, and seemed that fortune presented him with the means, when less he expected it. But I have sometimes heard our druids say that fortune likes to turn its will most often on the side where one waits less for one's turn. Alaric came to die, and Thierry, his son succeeded him, who, to have several brothers, had enough to deal with maintaining his states, without thinking of the enmities of his father. And so, wishing to make each one lovable, for goodness and liberality are the two magnets that attract the most friendship of each, from the beginning of his reign, he published a general abolition of all offenses done in his kingdom. This is a great beginning to average the return of Alcipi, if he could not return again, especially since Pimander had not forgotten the insult received. However, just as the Visigoths were the cause of his banishment, so fortune wanted to serve as an instrument of recall. Some time before, as I told you, Arthur, king of Great Britain, had instituted the Knights of the Round Table, which were a number of virtuous young men, obliged to seek adventures, punish the wicked, do justice to the oppressed, and maintain the honor of the ladies. Now the Visigoths of Spain, who then dwelt in Pamplona, in imitation of it, elected knights who went to various places, showing their strength and skill. It happened that at that time one of these Visigoths, after having run several countries, came to Marsili, where, having made his accustomed challenge, he defeated several of the knights of Pimander, whose heads he cut off, and, with extreme cruelty, as a testimony of his valor, sent them to a lady whom he was serving in Spain. Among the others, Amaryllis lost an uncle, who, like my father, not wishing to remain in the rest of country life, had followed the profession of arms, and because, during this estrangement, she had been curious enough to have heard of him ordinarily through certain young boys whom she and he had trained to this, as soon as this misfortune had befallen her, she wrote to him, not in opinion that he should return, but as expressing her displeasure, love, which is never in a beautiful soul without filling it with a thousand generous designs, did not allow my father to know the displeasure of Amaryllis to be caused by a man, without, incontinent, resolved to punish this arrogance, and so, with the leave of the emperor, came disguised in the house of Clent, who, knowing his deliberation, tried several times to entertain him, but love had stronger persuasions than he, and one morning when Pimander was going out to go to the temple, Alcipi appeared before him, armed with every word, and though he had his visor raised, if he were not recognized for the beard that had come to him since his departure, when Pimander knew his resolution, he made much of it known, for the hatred he had for this stranger because of his arrogance and cruelty, and, from the very hour, had the Visigoth warned by a herald of arms. To shorten it, my father defeated him, and presented the sword to Pimandra, and, without making himself known to anyone, except to Amaryllis, who saw him in the house of Clent, he returned to Byzance, where he was received as usual. However, Clent, who had no greater desire than to see him free again in Ferez, discovered it to Pimandra, who was very anxious to know the name of the one who had fought the foreigner. He, at first astonished, at last moved by the virtue of this man, 
asked if it was possible that he was still alive, to which Clent replied, recounting all his fortunes and all his long journeys, and finally what he had reached among all the kings he had served. Without lying, said Pamandu, the virtue of this man deserves to be sought and not banished, besides the extreme pleasure he has given me. Let him come back, therefore, and make sure that I cherish him and love him as he deserves, and that, from here, I forgive him all that he has done against me. Thus my father, after having remained seventeen years in Greece, returned to his homeland, honored with Pimander and Amasus, who gave him the most beautiful office that was close to their person. But see that it is only of us. One gets drunk on all things by abundance, and the desire satisfied remains without force. As soon as my father had the favors of fortune such as he would have known, he lost the taste and despised them. And when a good demon, who wanted to remove him from that abyss, where he had so often almost been shipwrecked, represented to him, as I heard him say, similar considerations, come this, Alcipi, what is your design? Isn't it enough to live happily as much as Clotho will take your days? If this is, where do you think you will find this good, if not at rest? Rest or can it be that out of business, cases, how can they distance the ambition of the court, since the same happiness of ambition lies in the plurality of cases? Have you not yet experienced enough the inconstancy with which they are full? How for the least this consideration in you, the ambition is to command several, each of these has the same purpose as you. These designs propose to them the same paths, going by the same path, can't they get to the very place where you are, and succeeding, since ambition is a place so narrow that it is not capable that of one, you must defend yourself from a thousand who will attack you, or yield to them. If you defend yourself, what can be your rest, since you have to keep yourself from friends and enemies, and day and night their fetters are sharpened against you? If you yield to them, is there anything so miserable as a fallen courtier? So, Alcipi, go into yourself, and remember that your fathers and forefathers were wiser than you. Do not want to be wiser or wiser it, but drive a diamond nail to the wheel of this fortune, which you have so often found so mutable. Return to the place of your birth, leave there this purple and change it into your first clothes, let this spear be changed into a hoot, and this sword into a beam to open the earth, and not the flank of men. There you will find at home the rest that in so many years you have never been able to find elsewhere. These, madam, were the considerations which brought my father back to his first profession. And so, to the great astonishment of all, but with much praise from the wisest, he returned to his first state, where he had our old statutes renewed, with so much contentment of each that he could say that he was at the height of ambition, although he had stripped himself of it, since he was so loved and honored by his neighbors that they considered him an oracle. And yet it was not yet the end of his sorrows, for being, after the death of Pimander, retired to his home, it was no earlier in our shores, that love did not renew his first wound, having with all the arrows of love, no sharper than that of conversation. Thus, here is Amaryllis so before in his thought that she gave him more trouble than all his first works. It was at this time that he took up the motto he had worn during all his travels, from a J. Penne, meaning pain J. A. I. From this love came a very great enmity, for Alce, father of Astray, was infinitely in love with this Amaryllis, and Amaryllis, during the exile of my father, had permitted this search by the command of his parents, and, at that hour, could not distract himself from it without giving him so much trouble that it was to despair him. On the other hand, Alcipi, who, stripping knight's habit had not left the courage, not being able to suffer a rival, came to the hands several times with Alce, who was not without courage, and it is believed that had it not been for the parents of Amaryllis, who resolved to give it to Alcipi, much misfortune had happened between them. But though by this marriage the roots of the quarrels were cut off, those of hatred remain so vivid that since then they have grown so high that there has never been familiarity between Alce and Alcipi. And that, said Celadon, addressing Sylvie, the beautiful nymph, that you hear, being in our hamlet, for I am the son of Alcipi and Amaryllis, and Astray is the daughter of Alce and Hippolytus. You may find it strange that I know so many peculiarities of the neighboring countries, but, madam, all I learned from it was from my father, who, telling me about his life, was forced to tell me together the things you have heard. Thus ended Celadon his speech, and certainly not without difficulty, for speaking it gave him much, to still have a bad stomach, and this was the cause that he told this story as briefly as he could. Galathi, 
however, remained more satisfied than he can believe to have known from which ancestors had descended this shepherd whom she loved so much.